And now, ladies and gentlemen, please fasten your seatbelts. Welcome to Prunercast. Yeah, business cards being swapped, beers being drunk. Can I say a nasty word? Can I say procrastination? With Pete Williams and Dom Gosher. How well did that go down? We can talk about that entire thing in a very another rant and soapbox episode if we want to. Visit us online at prunermarketing.com. Hey, Pete. Hey, mate. How's things? Good, good, good. Are you feeling better? Sorry to cut you off, but. That's all right. I'm, I'm pretty slow anyway, mate. Yeah, I am actually better now after, well, uh, supposedly my vacation, which turned into uh, bed rest due to the head cold. Man flu. Man, it was not man flu. I could still <laughs> walk. It wasn't man flu. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to this week's Preneurcast. Uh, a little bit delayed due to me, basically, being uh, incapacitated. Uh, not the best display of... Uh, <laughs> Of, of outsourcing and resource use there by me, but uh, oh well. Um, but we're back, Pete and I, and uh, raring to go. Pete, how's your week been? Uh, it's been good. This week has been a rest week, so I've had a, a little bit less training than usual. So um, feeling good, feeling feeling great, and all the usual sort of uh, shenanigans. It is my my world. It's been going well. Cool. I'm not. I'm not actually going to draw you on the on the um, Ironman training this week because, well, we try to keep the podcast under an hour. So, <laughs> yeah, let, let's not go there. Um, Pete, let's getting straight into it. Uh, we've been re- the number of inquiries and emails from the from the listeners has been uh, ramping up recently, and uh, we've noticed a couple of topics. The one that we talked about in last week's podcast, um, the seven levers, is a pretty constant thing we get feedback on, um, and also the. Uh, mastermind stuff and they're, they're pretty common topics we, we answer things about that quite regularly but there's been some very pointed questions come in about very very specific things you and i are both mac users yes absolutely um yay uh but not mac fanatics mac users we see that we both have a bit of a shared shared belief in this stuff which is that it's the best tool for the job not just that it's nice shiny aluminium that looks trendy and, and makes us look clever um <laughs> and, and in my case makes me look like i've got at least some modicum of style uh, Fair <laughs> but, enough. Uh, yeah, no, it, but it's it's the best tool for the job, and and a lot of things back that up, including the tools that people develop for them. Now, I know your workflow on on the Mac depends on quite a lot of very specific tools that really really optimize how you work. And over the next few weeks, hopefully, we can dig into that. But the first one is, in my mind, the biggie, and we had a, we've had a couple of questions about that, which is something that I also use, uh, and you and I swap a couple of tips on a regular basis on this. It's a program called OmniFocus. And uh, we had a couple of people ask how we use OmniFocus. Um, so I'm going to give, just give a quick bit of background on that because it's just it's just a word. If, you, if you've never heard of it and all the concepts it, it pertains to, then, then a lot of people are trying to switch off at the moment, find a stop button, you know, people stopping running in the middle of parks and beaches everywhere all over the world, trying to find that fast-forward button. What are these guys going on with? Um... There's a a concept out in the world called Getting Things Done. David Allen. David Allen's book. Uh, incredibly famous, incredibly popular, especially with a certain mindset of people, type of business, business people and uh, geeks. Um, but it's an, it is an excellent framework to help you manage tasks. It, it's not necessarily the be-all and end-all, but it's certainly a good start. And again, both Pete and I... Uh, we use this as a basis for our frameworks. One of the problems with getting things done is that it still gives you a lot of things to manage. <laughs> <laughs> you, you just that they, uh, the, the core of the principle of, of getting things done is that you need somewhere to put your list of things to do so that you don't carry them around in your head and forget about them. Um, and out of this, and some of them very specific things that... G- GTD, as it's called, getting things done is short to GTD. Out of the very specific things that, that you suggested to do with GTD, um, a, a software company called the Omni Group, who've written some awesome, awesome Mac software, um, came up with OmniFocus. And it really is a piece of software that's pretty much, well, it started out life pretty much 100% targeted at the GTD crowd. It's got lots and lots of uses. It's incredibly powerful. But like all incredibly powerful things, 
Uh, another example would be the program Photoshop, if anyone's ever used that. You take one look at it and go, ah, it gives you absolutely no idea where to start sometimes. So, Pete, we were asked, how do we use OmniFocus? How do we not just map getting things done into OmniFocus, but how does it fit into your daily work routine? Um, is that something that that we can talk about in less than a day? <laughs> yeah, well, absolutely. I think a good place to start is worth sort of just giving some framework around what the GDD, GTD process is. For cool. those who haven't read the book and don't really know about it, it's probably worth giving some context and, and, and framing this all to sort of, <laughs> again, reinforce a previous, previous episode we've had here on Preneurcast. Um, so let, let's start with that and we can kind of go from there because then we can then talk about why OmniFocus allows this process to work so well. Um, so basically, um, oh, as the door slams in the background, getting things done, well, getting things done is all about getting things done, obviously, through actionable steps. So what it basically means is having an objective of clean the garage is not really an actual action you can take. It's a series of processes that lead up to the result of having a clean garage. So you might have to call the skip company to organize a a skip bin. You might have to move the trailer from the driveway to get the skip bin in. You might have to do X, Y, Z and A, B, C. Or There's obviously a series of actionable steps you need to actually go through to achieve an outcome. And um, the argument is that the reason a lot of people don't get stuff done is because their task lists are outcome-based, not action-based. So it's really important to uh, get that distinction that when you are trying to actually do something, you can plan out a project to really make them actionable steps. What steps do I have to actually physically do? What actions should I take? in what order to get the end result I want. So that's sort of, I guess, the, the underlying premise of the, of the whole system. So you might have a, a, an outcome or a project to create, which is what you want to do, and you have to just work backwards and work out what are those steps I need to take. And then the process is to basically, as you go through things that come into your life that could be actionable, go through a process. And the first question is, is it actually actionable? Is this email I received? Is this text messages I received, is this bit of mail that I received actually actually actionable? Do I have to go and actually action this? Or is it just for reference? Or is it something to look at in six months' time? Or how to throw it out? So that's the first question you have to ask yourself is, is this piece of information that's come across my desk or my life actionable? If not, trash it, file it, whatever it might be. If it is actionable, let's process it right now. If it can be done under two minutes, just get it done, get it out of your life and move on. If it takes more than two minutes, okay, you've got some options. You either do it, as I said, if it's under two minutes, you do it and get it done. Can you delegate it? Can you give it to someone else to do it? Can you handball it to an assistant or a staff member or a partner or someone else so they actually do it? Get it to them so it's off your plate uh, and out of your life. Or do you have to defer it? Do you have to actually put it in a project list? So maybe you can't right now buy the milk that you need to or you can't... um, organize that skip bin because you don't have a phone around you or something like that. So it's all about them putting that action into a system that you can actually get back to at a future time when you are in a convenient position to actually take those actions required. Does that sort of sum up from your perspective, Dom? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, if you if you keep it at that level, because as we know it, it can get a little bit more involved than that. He's got some he's got some systems for pretty much everything. But if we keep it at the level that any project or goal has a series of actions that can that that need to be achieved in order to, or need to be done in order to achieve it, um, and that that in itself is is a, a great start to anything anything you want to do before you start trying to do it if you actually write down the steps to do it uh it becomes more manageable it becomes more doable it becomes less scary so that's pretty standard project management or just time management advice um but the 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 do delegate defer do delegate defer file or de- or delete is uh is a pretty good way of sweeping through um we'll come back to that because that that actual review of the list of things that you've given yourself to do is a big part 
of, of using tools and managing this information. But yeah, that's a good summary um, of, of the, the, the key parts of the getting things done system. Okay, so basically what the, the first step of the, the whole process is is to have a, a what's referred to as an inbox. So ideally not your actual email inbox, an inbox of things to do, projects, ideas, actions to take in the future. Uh, and OmniFocus make it really, really easy. This is probably where the starting point is. There's a, an inbox feature where you can add entries. So you can go in there and put various entries for a whole bunch of uh, different things. So, like I've got in here, um, make a phone call about Tour de France next year, um, review a website, um, record audio for ABC, uh, break down some stuff in my accounting software. So these are just some random thoughts that I've had recently that I haven't really done anything else but chuck them into an inbox. So that way they're out of my head, they're, they're not sort of continually um, coming up and bubbling up and saying, oh, hey, have you done this yet, have you done this yet, have you done this yet? because you've got it in a system, in an inbox, so I can go and work with later. So that's the first thing. And the beautiful thing with OmniFocus is that there's an iPhone app, there's an, uh, a, obviously a Mac app, there's an iPad app, which sync. Um, so no matter what device or where I'm at, I've got some sort of Apple device on me on some level, and I can get that idea down really, really quickly into, that, into the inbox that will then get synced across all my... Um, uh, platform so I have access to that idea and that thought later so that's the really important thing is to make sure you're getting access to the inbox as much as you can whether you've got OmniFocus or using a notepad or something like that it's really really handy and there's some really cool keyboard shortcuts that you can have with OmniFocus as well I just use option spacebar that pops up a window no matter what application I'm in that where I can quickly enter in a uh, an idea that then can save straight into my inbox so from the middle of something, watching a video, having a conversation, I can just option space bar, the window pops up, and I can just dump in really quickly in shorthand what the idea might be that I'll go back to later in the review stage. Uh, so that's the, the, the first part of OmniFocus, which makes it really, really easy to just have a collection point of all your ideas and, and action points and, and things like that. Now, can I just interrupt there and, and just talk about this from my perspective? Because I was very, very guilty of what we used to call the post-it note forest. <laughs> I have a terrible short-term memory. And I, if I needed to remember something or do something, it, it turned into a post-it note that got stuck on my screen. And I have somewhere a photograph, uh, which I may share if, I, if I'm feeling brave, of my very large iMac screen that literally the entire surround of the screen was post-it notes at one point and this was a few years ago before I discovered getting things done and also before I discovered OmniFocus the, then this core idea that you just put across this capture idea instead of trying to hold it in your head or instead of leaving it in your inbox as a remind in your email inbox as a reminder which an awful lot of people do if you capture all these things in one place, then it cleans out all these other places. It stops you having a pile of post-it notes, uh, th things stuck to your fridge, um, emails clogging up your inbox. And, and, and all these things, they, from personal experience, they actually give you this little tiny bit of stress. That email that Yesterday, you left it in your inbox and you marked it back as unread or flagged it because you've got to do something with it. As it creeps towards the bottom of the screen and starts to go off the screen, that's going to start stressing you because you're going to, you're going to look at it and go, but if that goes off the screen, I won't remember and I won't see it and, 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 and things like that. So this, this was actually a really big part. It's a very simple thing of the Getting Things Done system, but it was a really big part of why I, I like the system. And when OmniFocus came along and that, well, using a big word, ubiquitous capture method, um, whether it's on my Mac if I'm using that or on my iPhone or on my iPad, that ability to not have to make a decision where I'm going to make that note, I just put it all in OmniFocus, was almost life-changing in itself. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you so can free your mind up to look at, to look and think about the, the actual task you're working on right now and don't get distracted by other things bubbling back up. Uh, and the good thing is you can, you know, you can take snippets of an email and you can dump the whole email into an inbox. So that way you might hear people talk about inbox zero. That's one of the ways they get to inbox zero is moving all the actionable things out of their inbox 
into a different system, which is their entire life of action or tasks, not just email related actions. It's everything's in in one big bucket, which you can then sift through and, and, and sort out, which is really, really handy. So from there, what's the next step, Dom? Where, where do you go from the inbox? Well, it, it's, it's as you described it. Um, at, at a regular time, and this is really important, really important in getting things done, at a regular time that you set aside, you need to sit down and review. And, and David Allen calls this the review process. And you sit down and you do that assessment that you talked about. The, can you do it? Is it actionable? Can you do it? Can it? And, and do you do this in? I mean, he says do it in order. Don't don't put things back on the pile. All this different detailed advice, which is in the book. But the the, the big thing here is set aside a regular time. Um, and, I, and this is one of the points that we can discuss as to how regular we both do this. But set aside a regular time. Go down that list of actions, which are now pretty much in one place. And if they're not, you also need to go around and collect your little bits of. Pull the post-it notes off your screen, take the things off the fridge door, you know, collect your notepad pages and, and just put them all in one place in a big pile. Then work your way down, each one at a time, and make a decision. Can I, can, is it actionable? If it is, can I do it now? If you can, do it. If you can't do it now, can you defer it? Can you delegate it? Do you even really need to do it? Or is it just reference material that can be filed? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Um, and this that's that is a really again another one of those power steps that that change the way that I do things because again these post-it notes would would litter my screen for one reason and one reason only because I never looked at them they just became this extra yellow pretty surround on my screen you become as as David Allen says numb to the pile numb to the stack whatever it piles grow in people's houses if you're not the fastidious tidier then things can pile up very quickly on your desk books you thought you were going to read notes you made to yourself um the coffee cup suddenly becomes a paperweight on top of the pile of notes and things like that um so this regular review is really important absolutely so uh, let's, let's actually dive into some omnifocus relevant stuff now because there's plenty of applications out there there's some other great ones for the mac like things is another one and there's Remember the Milk, which is a web-based tool made from some Australians, actually, which is pretty cool. And there's plenty of Windows-based um, applications that actually will allow you to run the GTD process and run your life through the software stuff. So obviously to be relevant to and respectful to the, the listeners who have actually asked us questions about how do we use OmniFocus and how do we actually make it work for us because there's so many different ways you can customize it. Let's actually delve into that. So uh, for people who have OmniFocus and have a Mac, let's uh, you know, give some ideas of exactly how I uh, and, and yourself, Dom, structure the, the OmniFocus world because we could do a whole episode just on getting things done, which is um, worth just buying the audio book and listening to it two or three times because it's, it's a great system and you know, there's not much more you can add that, that David Allen hasn't already addressed in, in the book. So in, in terms of the way we, we structure it, I've got um, obviously the inbox and then I've got a range of different folders and a structure based on different projects and I guess what I what I class as business units in my life in terms of the different you know businesses and projects I'm working on, I try and break it down that way. So uh, under my library, which is what you call all your various projects, because once you have an inbox item, to get it out of your inbox, you put it into a, uh, a project. So you might have one of the projects, you know, using the bad example before, is cleaning the garage. And under that, you list all the steps in order of what needs to be done. Uh, or it might be, you know, for example, the Seven Livers Mastermind Program. I've got a, a bunch of stuff I need to do to make that um, work for all the people involved and, and all the people who are going through that. Um, there's also, you know, MCG project, or it might be, you know, an outsourcing project, whatever it might be, I've got a different folder. So I've, I've got a miscellaneous folder, which is just a folder where I chuck in all miscellaneous to-do items, one-off action pieces that don't re- re- really relate to an overall project. They're just one-off little tasks I have to do. Um, so I just chuck in anything from my inbox that's just a one-off task I need to do into that particular box called miscellaneous. Uh, and the good thing is when you actually categorize stuff, an actual particular action item, you can give it a start date and a due date. So if it's, you know, it doesn't need to be done for three or four weeks, you can give it a start date for three or four weeks' time. So that way it won't actually pop up on any of your actual actionable to-do item lists until 
it's relevant. You can give it due dates. You can also give it a time. So you can say this particular task or action is only going to take three or four minutes. But more importantly, what you can do is you can give it a context, which we'll come back to a little bit later. But just to give a little bit of um, understanding here is you can give a context such as, I don't know, Gmail. It might be um, Milk Bar. It could be um, Post Office. It could be Telephone. So that way you can look at, okay, I've got a telephone with me right now. What action items can I do that allow me or need to have a telephone? So you can actually then work out actions you can take based on the context of where you are in your life, whether you are down the shops, whether you are in the office, whether you're near a video camera, whether you've got your phone on you, which is really important. So the miscellaneous group is just a whole bunch of random one-off tasks that I need to do. Um, and then tagged by context, so I can work out it later on when I'm doing my um, sort of a, a sort of an intermediate review process, which I'll touch on. I can quickly see, okay, well, here's a bunch of phone calls I can easily make and just ram through those four or five projects that might relate to various, or oh, sorry, four or five phone calls that might relate to various projects. So the mis miscellaneous box is one I use quite a bit. Uh, I've also got an important box. So the important box is a fundamentally it's similar to miscellaneous, but it's the important stuff. So miscellaneous might be just very random things that aren't overly important to me, but um, the important box is stuff that I really have to do um, that aren't really a project, but it's just something I have to actually do. So I put in the important box to give it a bit more emphasis so it stands out. So that's the, the important box. Uh, and then from there, I just have a whole bunch of folders with um, various projects in them. So I've got a printer marketing folder. I've got a Pete and Dave show folder for the various um, projects that I work on with David J. I've got uh, an Own the G folder for all the um, MCG project sort of stuff. Uh, and I've got you know a whole bunch of other uh, folders for various other projects and businesses and, and things like that. Um, so every one of my major project or business units has a folder. And under that folder, I've got projects. So you know the Printer blog has its own project. Um, Seven Levers has its own project. Uh, going Analog has its own project. Uh, coaching has its own project. So under that, I can actually allocate the actions that relate to each one of those projects under a subfolder, which is a business unit. So that's sort of how I, again, I, I guess I structure everything inside OmniFocus. So I break it all down by business unit and then by projects. Now, just to uh, ask a, a kind of an OmniFocus detail question here. So. You you mentioned their context, and context is a very powerful thing, as you said, where if if when you're doing your review and you decide that this item is an action or is actionable, um, when you put it on your list of actions, if you assign a context to it, I, I can do it, but I can only do it if I'm on the telephone, or I should do it when I'm in the office, or it's for the supermarket, which is a little bit obvious if it's a shopping list item, but still. Um, that, later on, as you say, helps you break up, again, this mass of just... this mass of actions that you've got to do. One of the things that I love about OmniFocus is, is that by... when I go through my review, luckily looking at my inbox, and I assign that context, it's actually a field in OmniFocus called context. And I can actually select from a list, which is nice, um, and the, a list that I've defined. And then later on, when I'm looking at my, in your case, your folders and your projects, you can actually sort by that information. So if you, if as you say, if you are outside, but you have your telephone with you and you have five minutes, you can quickly pop up OmniFocus and basically ask it the question, what telephone calls do I need to make? Well, exactly right. So, and again, the, the context idea was another one of those really powerful elements of the getting things done model that really helped me. Because sometimes you're just not, well, you're not in the office or you're not in the frame of mind to do a particular thing or you are in the frame of mind to do a particular thing. Uh, I do find telephone calls one of the most useful ones. Um, telephone, telephone calls and emails I need to write. Because the telephone calls gets rid of all the post, a lot of post-it notes that are on my screen, and emails I need to reply to or write is one of the real big helps to getting things out of my inbox in my uh, in my email system. 
um, because a lot of people leave emails and put stars and flags and things on them in their in their email inbox because just to remind them that they've got to do something with that email. Yeah, exactly. And the other beautiful thing with the getting things done process, and in particular, OmniFocus makes it so easy, is that you have the ability, <clears throat> pardon me, to make a project either a parallel project. Oops, why can't I change that? Wait, let me change it. Hang on, let me just go into the inspector. Don't click and talk. <laughs> <laughs> I know people hate it, but it's important. I'm, I'm teaching software. You can make a project either a sequential project or a parallel project. Yeah. And, and what the beautiful thing of that is, some projects require you to make uh, a series or do undertake a series of actions in a sequential manner. So you can't do the second step until the first step's done. So the beautiful thing is, if you make a project sequential, if you have to make a phone call as a fourth step, and it's a sequential project, obviously you can't make that phone call until the first one, two, and three steps are completed. So that means is when you're going to look at these sort of different perspectives, as you were saying before, Dom you will never see that phone call appear on your to-do list because you physically can't do it yet because it's a fourth task. There's other tasks to do in that project first. Whereas, so I was going to say with a parallel project, what you can do is like, you know, that's the, the, the miscellaneous box I spoke about or the important box. They're just a bunch of random things that can be done complete, completely isolated to each other. So having a parallel box means I can just dump everything in there and when I go and look at a perspe- uh, perspective, um, if there's phone calls to make that are in that box, I'll see them all because they're not interrelated or sequential or anything like that. Absolutely. And just, just to clarify, and, and this is a, a kind of a, a little bit of a, a leap ahead with, with, with OmniFocus and knowledge of OmniFocus, one of the features, and, and in some cases, depending on how you use it, a key feature of OmniFocus is that you can tell it to only show you next actions. And this is what Pete's talking about here with whether it's um, a due date or a start date or a context or a sequential or parallel group of actions. OmniFocus can take on board all of those criteria. Are you in this context right now? Are you in the office? Has this particular project started or is this action valid to start at this time? Um, is it the next action within its project or is there something that comes before it uh, or is it a parallel one? And based upon all those things, and it sounds really complicated, but basically what you do is you open OmniFocus and look at it and it, it says this is what to do next. And it literally, you, I've got thousands and thousands of actions in my inbox because I work for a lot of clients and I manage my clients and client projects this way. Um, but my next actions list for today is probably 10 things and and omnifocus is managing that so again it's that headspace thing i know omnifocus has got my back i know omnifocus knows what i've got to do and i know that i can click a button a big obvious button and omnifocus will just foop and show me everything so i can see the entire project plan in, on the screen for every client I've got, every step I've got to take. But when I put it back in its normal mode, it hides all that extra stuff and just shows me exactly what I've got to do next. Which, if, you, if you're like me and short-term memory is a, a, a bit of a commodity, that's awesome. Absolutely. Well, look, we, we might as well, let's, let's dive into some of these um, perspectives because this is all about OmniFocus specifically. And OmniFocus has this thing that you're referring to called perspectives and it comes with a bunch of default perspectives which are fundamentally just a filter of all the information you've put into the system so you've got like uh, one option which i use uh, quite a bit is my available tasks filter or perspective if you will and what that does is it actually groups all the actions that i can actually make right now by context sorry no not, not by context sorry by project what am I looking at? This is just looking strange. Hang on a second. Ignore me, guys. Let me fix that up. So if I go See, to pres- don't, don't click and talk. Well, I, yeah, true, true, true. So if I go to um, my available tasks perspective, it actually will then actually break all the different tasks I've got to do across all my projects by context. So I've got like email, what emails I have to send, online, what stuff do I need to actually do on the web, what videos do I have to record, what phone calls do I have to make? What stuff do I actually have to write? Whether it might be just any sort of writing. 
and a whole bunch of other contexts as well. So I can then look at this and go, okay, I'm gonna get through all my emails across all my different projects. So I can simply look at this and it will show me all the emails that I can possibly write right now. Because it's showing me if it's a next action or a sequential related list, um, it's gotta be the next action I can take. If it's a parallel list, it'll just show me all the options I can do. So it breaks it down really, really well. Uh, and then I've also got one called today. And what that does is that shows me all the tasks I have to do today broken down by project. So it's the same information, just displayed slightly different. So I can either look at the, what I can do right now based on context, so I've got a phone, or if I want to actually break my day up because I'm in this particular mood that day to work on this project, then that project, then the next project. So I might be making a different phone call every 20 minutes. Rather than chunking those phone calls together, I want to just work project by project, I have this today perspective and it breaks down what are the actions I can take for each of these projects. And as soon as I tick one off, it then pops up the next action if it's a sequential based uh, project, which is really, really cool. So I can sort of say, look, I'm gonna work on these three projects today or these three projects in the next hour and, and work through that way. So that's a great way of actually chunking your options. So you can chunk it by project and what's available to me based on project or what's available to me based on context. So that's one of the really cool quick buttons I can hit under perspectives and it gives me those two options. And, and again, you can create and design your own perspectives because they're just configurable filters based upon the data stored in the system, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Now, now that's, that's kind of, I, I wanna, we've, we've been rambling on about this, this software for quite some time and, and we were asked a couple of specific, specific questions. So I'm gonna drill down now, I'm gonna ask you some specific questions about how you use this. And I'm maybe going to feedback about if there's any, anything I have that, that's different or, or because the, the, the centralized inbox inside of OmniFocus is pretty much everybody. You have the option, as you said, what a, you can copy text into it. You can link files to it. You can just type straight into it. Um, and you can use this quick capture box that you talked about to 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 actually make a, an entry in the inbox. Now, the question about that is, you can actually fill out a lot of this extra data, the name of the project, start and end date, context, things like that, in in the inbox. Do you bother doing that, or is it about speed of capture for you? Uh, speed of capture. It's all about just getting it into the inbox, and I'll worry about the actual... Uh, allocation or reallocation of it at a, at a later date. I just want to try and get in there as quick as possible. So I'll, cool. I'll do the um, option space to get in the, the quick idea. And then I think it's option, what is it? No, then it's command um, talking, the talking mark one, whatever that is, the talking mark button. And that yeah. gives you the note section. So your option space bar gives me the actual quick capture. I can type in the, the, the main idea of whatever this is. But if I've got some notes that I don't want to forget, like I might be call Scott, might be the actual action, but then I'll hit um, command talking mark, uh, and then it'll pop up with the note section. Where I can just dump in, talk to Scott about A, B, C, D, and E. Here's the idea. Here's a bit more information around that particular task. So I don't worry about the projects and the context and stuff like that. I will yep. worry about the notes related to that particular uh, inbox item. So keyboard cool. shortcuts make that easy. Yeah, I mean, I, avoiding the keyboard shortcuts for a second, uh, just for the normal <laughs> human beings. Um, I, that's that's pretty much exactly what I do. I get I get a one liner in in the the title, um, in the name box, whether it's quick capture or or just just straight to the tool itself, and I do use that notes field. I write myself uh, what I you know. It's great. It's it's text, and I can write anything on there. Certainly more than I could ever write on a post-it note. Um, I, I've never been one to be guilty of just writing a phone number on a post-it note without writing the person's name on it. Um, <laughs> I'll do that all the time. No, I, I I learned that lesson years ago. Um, but but certainly it's a one-liner and some some extra information but i don't i don't worry about filling out those extra fields um because it's just about capture as you said right at the beginning having a having a quick way to capture this stuff means that you don't get distracted from what it was you were doing 
you can f carry on focusing on the main task at hand, whatever you were working on. And if something pops into your head, you just pop up a box for OmniFocus, drop the, the, the reminder in, and any notes at that time. You're probably off task for 30 seconds maximum. Absolutely. And, yep. Yeah, and, and you did bring up the ninja tip, and this is something that I'll, I'll probably will talk about when we're feeling super mega geeky of, of keyboard shortcuts because you and I, again, are mega, mega keyboard shortcut people. The amount of time I actually have my hand touching a mouse or a trackpad is tiny when I'm working. I, I operate... All, one of the great things about the Mac is that, that you can do pretty much anything by pressing a sequence of keys on the keyboard. And there are, there are tools to help you do that, but we'll come back to that. But even just using the mouse and going to the program and, and clicking on the inbox and clicking new item, you can still get one of these things in in between 15 and 30 seconds, and it's out of the way, it's stored, it's safe. And it's also synchronized across any other devices that you've got linked to this. Absolutely. I actually find myself, and this is one of the questions somebody asked, I find myself using my iPad as, or, or depending on what I'm carrying, my iPad or my iPhone, iPod Touch, as my primary capture device. Sometimes even if I'm sat at the computer. Yeah, I still use a computer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you've got a, you, you're, on a, you're on a MacBook Pro, so it's slightly different. But it's, just, it's one of those things, it's a bit like, Having a notepad, so you turn away from the computer and you scribble a note on a notepad, it actually helps me change my focus for that brief period of time, focus on writing that task down and all the notes for it, and then put it back. It also means that as I'm walking around without my computer, I don't find myself trying to option spacebar the uh, the door handle, for example. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah? Option spacebar my Starbucks cup. <laughs> So, so we've got our inbox. We've filled it up. How often do you do your reviews? Uh, my my review is generally uh, I try and do it once a week. Occasionally, do it more than that. Um, I try and discipline myself to sort of say, you know, once a week. I, I plan my week once a week. Um, so that's, I guess, the, the the quick and succinct answer to that question. Once a week. I look at okay. it regularly. Um, to yeah. say what I'm a, jobs for today but in terms of clearing out my inbox I, it often happens more than once a week but I, I do one proper GTD style review generally once a week if, if I can um, you know discipline myself to do it but that that is it isn't it it's the discipline to block out that time at a regular time each week if you can ideally and and to sit down and do the do the process properly Exactly. And I'm, I, I'm pretty much with you. I mean, in, David Allen recommends that you do it at least once a week, preferably at the same time, preferably at the at the end of a working day or even the end of the weekend, depending on how you're, you structure your life. Um, but but actually, you mentioned something there, which is about planning your week. And I I like to do mine either Friday or Sunday afternoon or evening, so that I know what's coming next week. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm a Sunday guy. You're a Sunday guy. I'm a Sunday guy. I, yeah. Well, well. Unfor I, it used to be Sunday, but I got this huge bunch of clients in Australia, so Sunday <laughs> afternoon and Sunday night for me is like Monday morning for you guys. <laughs> so that's a write-off. <laughs> Fair enough. Fr Friday afternoon, my time. You guys are all in bed, so I'm good. Um, so I've kind of moved that around. But it is important that you do these big kind of checks and sweeps once a week so i go i go once a week as well but i'm one of those people that uh, i'm convinced i'm missing something so i do delve into the inbox regularly and just make sure that anything that was major that needed a, a major response that i didn't handle um that, that that gets put into a project and tracked and and done and actioned so i kind of break the system a little bit I just I go I go scan through the inbox probably once a day, at the end of the day, and go right. What did I capture today that I really that I didn't action I didn't do right there and then, and have I missed it and do I need to pick up on it? But the big sweep and the the cleaning down to to empty of the inbox is a is a once a week thing for me. So cool. We're pretty, we're pretty similar on that. So what when you when you go through your inbox and you're starting to allocate these these actions or new projects and things, what fields do you fill out? 
What fields do you really use, and what field? What fields do you really use, and which fields do you rarely use? Ooh, okay. So, um, obviously, the uh, description box is a pretty straightforward one because you need to have that. Uh, I use a project box, obviously, to put it into a project and context to give it a context for for later. Um, don't always use the start and due dates. I, I use due date when it's important. So if it's a a bill to pay or I made a promise to someone, I'll uh, I'll, I'll do the due date. Um, mm-hmm. I, I I use a start date occasionally if it is a um, item that doesn't need to get started for a little bit of time and I, I don't want to get it um, popping up on my to-do list for a couple of days, I'll, I'll give it a start date for later on, not because I don't have to start till then, but it's not important, so why worry about it? There's possibly other things that need to pop up. So I'll occasionally use a start date. Um, timing, bu- timing box, yeah, I go through through phases where I use the timing box where you can actually say this task should take five minutes, this task should take ten minutes. And I go through phases for, for no other reason or no justifiable reason. There's just uh, phases. Um, but one thing I do use quite a bit is the reoccurring function. Because what you can do with some of these items is make them reoccurring. So it pops up into your um, to-do list every Monday or every Thursday. So rather than using a calendar to remind you to do stuff, uh, I've found putting my reoccurring tasks in OmniFocus a much easier way to go because then, it, again, it's all in one central place. Um, so rather than using a calendar to, to give reminders of, of actions, I'm putting them all in OmniFocus with a, uh, a, a reminder set um, against the actual item itself. That, and that's very good of you. That's very GTD because David <laughs> Allen does say don't use your calendar as a reminder to do something. You use it as a better way of booking out your time uh, for meetings and being, and being places. Absolutely. So, and I, I have to say I am the same. Um, I, I use... Pretty much, I pretty much do do what you do um, uh, for the same reasons. I used due date um, if, if it's something that has to be done by a certain date. I very rarely I, – I, I got a little bit bogged down in using the timing thing. But ironically, when I was time poor, I found myself using those time allocations more. <laughs> but it took so much time to use the time allocations and go through the sweep that I just gave up. Yeah. It was – I just 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 do it. Um, Absolutely. And so, and yeah, I, I'm I'm still the more advanced features of, of OmniFocus. I'm still not using, and I'm I'm going to be quite open about that because, as you said at the beginning, the getting things done system can be done with a notepad, notepad and paper, sheets of paper. In fact, David Allen recommends a, a series of folders that you use and a, and a notepad, and to do this in sheets of paper and things like that. So tools just enhance that, but you can always get bogged down in using tools. And I've, I, I got myself in the right mess with OmniFocus when I first started, especially as they were, I, I've had, I got the first, like one of the first beta copies of OmniFocus and I've been working with it ever since. So it's, it's changed quite a lot and its functionality has changed. And I got myself in a in a mess with all the different advanced features that I was using, and things were just flying all over the place. And it was taking me more time to manage the tasks than do them. <laughs> so I yeah. paired it right back to the bare minimum that actually helps me do the job, and I'm happy with that. Um, and and I'm I'm now working my way up. And this this brings me as as we as we're getting you know quite a long way into the podcast, it brings me to a to a. A, a big thing that that helped me take the next step with OmniFocus, and I, I think this is something that you've read as well. It's an ebook that that I found called "Creating Flow with OmniFocus." Yeah, by a guy called Karosh Dini, um, and this is awesome. We've we've tried to talk about our system and the way that we use OmniFocus, but Karosh's book actually literally gives you a, a theoretical situation, a, a fictitious person and, and a situation, and then takes you through how you can actually get OmniFocus to to work in that in that in that way for that particular project or that person or whatever. And he also gives you some real ninja tips for modeling real world situations. Because that was always where I fell over with OmniFocus. I was always trying to get it to do something that was really easy on a piece of paper. 
and and I think that's what we do with tools. I think I think we really do do that with tools. We we get bogged down. It's like okay, I can do this on a piece of paper. I would do this. I'd draw a circle around it. And the number of people that have that, that have got very upset because they just can't just draw a circle around something on their computer is is quite a large number. Um, mm. And and but Karosh's book I think is awesome for that. Uh, oh. Both the, both the tips and the systems. So I I highly recommend that to anybody who's looking at using OmniFocus. Can I ask you a question? You can. Mr. Dom. Let's say, for example, I have OmniFocus on my computer right now and yep. I'm having a crack at it and I'm mm-hmm. kind of stumbling my way through and it's not too bad. Mm-hmm. I go and invest in, in the book and mm-hmm. want to play around with the stuff that's talked about in that book. Is there any way to run two versions of OmniFocus at the same time? There's no way to run two versions of OmniFocus, the software, but... Um, I, there's, there's two answers to your question. There's a technical answer, which is that OmniFocus backs itself up properly every time you start it and also periodically as you're using it throughout the day. So you can restore from a backup. So you could back up, and I'm, by the way, I'm not recommending this, but you could back it up, find that backup file, and you can actually, it will tell you where it is, by the way. You can, you can consciously press a button to say, back my system up, which I recommend you do regularly. Um, and send your file to Dropbox or something. Um, you can consciously do that and then wipe the system and start again and you'll be able to see everything. But what I do, and what I actually have done, hand in the air, my name is Dominic and I made a right mess in OmniFocus, um, is I have got a DMZ. Uh, and a DMZ is, uh, is a, a very old term from the military. It's a demilitarized zone. Don't go here. And I've got a folder called DMZ. And I literally took the entire contents of my OmniFocus that I messed up and I dragged it into the DMZ folder. Now, and then this I told them. Is this a folder inside OmniFocus or a folder? It's inside of OmniFocus, okay. yes. It's yep. a folder inside of OmniFocus, just like your projects folder inside the, uh, inside the library. And I, I dragged, it, dragged everything into the DMZ and told OmniFocus to ignore it for a while. Okay. So nothing in that folder shows up on any of my. Uh, projects, context, due, next, any of it. Um, so there you go. Yeah, that's my one issue with OmniFocus, if I have one, is that you can't basically create two databases and run two versions of it, which is kind of annoying to a certain extent. There's, I think there's some applications where it could be handy to have two different versions because, you know, ideally, um, at one point where I was like spending a lot of time inside Infinity, I wanted to, to have one version of OmniFocus just for infinity and one for the rest of my life. So when I'm sort of in the office working in the business, um, I always sort of speak, talk about working on the business rather than in it, but when I'm working in the business, I'd love one version of this that I can open up for in the business stuff and all the various you know micro tasks and micro projects that are the part of the, the, the work thing. Because like, let's say, for example, you're a, an entrepreneur who's um, you know, got a real-time job and trying to start your own business on the side and be entrepreneurial. It'd be ideal to be able to have one only focus for your work world so you get more stuff done at work and you can be more efficient there but another version so you've got different contexts and different um, you know and obviously you can write filters and you can sort of filter things in and out that's not that's, it's, it's definitely possible but just to sort of have one version for work and one version for home would be really cool now one thing that I have seen some people do is and this this I, I toyed with this for a while but I now don't I don't, don't need it invariably there are things that are more complicated and things that are less complicated. You, for example, your infinity things may be more complicated or less complicated than, than your preneur marketing things. Okay? And what I've found people do is they go, uh, they've used their inbox in OmniFocus as their primary capture because it's always there. Yeah. And they actually then use another tool like, for example, Things, which is, again, a very, it's a very pretty tool, Things is. Um, it's now a Mac desktop plus iPhone and iPad app, which is synchronized. And they, they consciously take things out of their OmniFocus inbox that belong to that simple world, and they put them in Things, because Things is actually less powerful than OmniFocus and is more suited to managing more simple things. Absolutely. So they physically have a completely different piece of software. 
not just a different version or a different database or whatever. They have a completely different piece of software. And I know people that do that, and it works really well. Um, and if your life is, is that way inclined, from a compartmentalization point of view, long word for the day, um, then, then that's one way to solve that. Because when you do your sweep, your review, or your weekly review, you can go ahead and do that. You don't have to put things in OmniFocus. Just like you, if it's an action that takes two minutes or less, you just go ahead and do it and then say it's done. And it never gets filed under a project or anything in OmniFocus. Um, similarly, you could take the project or the, act, the whole project or the action steps and pop them in things. I love it. And on that note, let's call it a show. All right, guys. Hopefully, this has been helpful. Well, one there was one last question, and that sorry. question was premature. No, no, no. Sorry. I no, no, no. It's okay. First time for everything, sir. Um, they, they, they one of the other questions was: you can buy OmniFocus on the Mac, you can buy it on the iPhone, you can buy it on the iPad. Where do I start? Uh, now, I have my, I have an answer for that. Oh. What, do, what do you think? Personally, for me, my personal answer for me is the Mac version because it's a lot more powerful and I live on my MacBook Pro. So, but I think the correct answer would be what tool do you use the most? And buy it for that version. Okay. My my answer is pretty much if you've got an iPad, get it for the iPad first. It's a sexy looking app, isn't it? It's not only is it a sexy looking app, it's incredibly powerful. And it's incredibly usable in the context of the iPad. The iPhone, my iPhone version or iPod Touch version, I use primarily as a very quick capture application because of the synchronization. I know it's safe. And also, I use it as a quick context review. I'm at the post office. I'm in the supermarket. I'm out and about. Have I got any phone calls? That kind of thing. But I don't use it. I can't use it to do a review. It gives me a headache. Um, I can't use it to manage the tasks and the, the projects and things like that because the screen's too small and it's not really made for it. It's, you can do it, don't get me wrong, but it's not a, an enjoyable experience. Whereas I found myself managing not to start the desktop version of OmniFocus f- all week, weeks at a time, because I've got the iPad version. And a lot of people have said the same thing, that the, that the iPad version, if you own an iPad, the iPad version is probably enough for most people as a first application. And bear in mind, like if you're like me and you've got a desktop machine or a heavier laptop, you're more likely to have your iPad with you both for capture and review than you are your machine. True, very, very true. So that's my advice. I would say iPad first, and then if you find yourself with with a lot of complex work to manage, I'd then go to the desktop um, and the iPhone, the iPhone last, and away you go. Um, the, the, by the way, for those of you who think, oh, I've got my iPhone, it's ubiquitous. I, I really need to use it for capture. There are some very clever toys within OmniFocus. One of which is that you can email things to OmniFocus. Yes. That's very um, handy which is very handy, so that kind of solves that problem. And that's my input. And on that, sir, I think we should finish. See you next week. See you next week. You've been enjoying another fine episode of PrinterCast with Pete Williams and Dom Gocher. Make sure to hang out with the boys online at www.printermarketing.com or drop them a line via printercast at printergroup.com.